Should I do this and speak, right? Uh, Alexa. Oops. Oh, this is wrong. Why didn't you me? Don't do anything. Yeah, I just want to make sure there's no. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alexa, open my list helper. Welcome to my list helper skill. I track your grocery and chores lists. What can I do for you?
Mic check. Mic check. One, two. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. One, two. Mic check. Hello, hello. Hello, welcome. Hello, mic check.
<laughs> um, but no, please, there's a beautiful spread out there. Um, please see any of the galvanized staff are located around the room. We've got these beautiful name tags. If you need any assistance throughout uh, the night, if you want to know any more about the educational offerings here at Galvanize, you want to know, hey, James, where'd you say that bathroom was again? We're here to help you. We also have drink tokens. Appreciate if you could wait at the end of the night to drink too many of those, but we do have an awesome show in, in tag view here. So a little bit about the night today and how it goes. So once I hop off the stage here, I'm going to hand it off to Danny, who is the lead instructor. He's going to tell you a lot about the program, the educational offering, all of the sort of trials and tribulations that these students have gone through in the past six months. If you're friends and family, I'm sure you've heard it firsthand yourselves as well. But he's going to give a really good overview of what is full stack web development, what is this program, you know, what have these students done these six months beyond the awesome capstone projects that you're about to see right now. Then we're just going to kick it off. We're going to hand it off to Dario, who's going to be our first presenter. We're going to do about eight presentations. We'll take a break. At that time, you can utilize the restrooms again. They're just sharp left out there past the reception desk. Fill up on refreshments again, um, all of that good stuff. And then join us again for our last eight presentations. And then we'll be joined with closing remarks from Kyle Overly. So without further ado, I'd love to hand it off to Danny to say a little bit more about the program. Thank you. I use computers. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. So my name is Danny Fritz. I am the lead instructor for G43. Uh, yeah, so I was an instructor for these, these fine, fine students. Uh, it has been an absolute honor to be the teacher for these students. Uh, but first, I want to tell you, like, what does it mean to be a galvanized student or graduate? Uh, it means they have skills, and that does include JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, but the ones that we really like to point out are some new life skills that we teach here. So some of the new life skills you might teach are working in teams, learning to learn, uh, teaching others. So when you come out of here, you're not just a programmer. You're actually a great team member and a better person. Um, so I want to acknowledge the instructional staff that helped make these students uh, who they are today. So Aaron is resident. You can raise your hand. Go ahead and clap. <laughs> Isaac's in the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have Kyle Coberly in the back. We got Chad. Yeah. Is Roberto here? We got Roberto, so yeah. Kim. <laughs> yeah. um, Matt, who's not here right now, but yeah. Is Peter here? Yeah? No? Nope. All right. <laughs> and finally, Wes. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So, a lot of instructors came through this cohort. Uh, so, so, now the students. So, let's give them a round of applause for just being so freaking awesome. Uh, their time here in the last six months is probably like almost nothing you can compare it to. Uh, they like stop their lives. They come here. They stop getting an income most of the time. Uh, they're just, they're like, this is it. Like a lot of times, like this is their last chance is what kind of what they feel like. Uh, they do their absolute hardest. There's blood, sweat, tears, uh, all just every hardship you can ever imagine happens in this classroom. Uh, within those six months, uh, it is, it is no small feat to be where these students are today. Uh, let's give them just one more round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I would like, it is my greatest honor to hand it off to Daria to, yeah. <laughs> Is this on? 
Yeah, I can hear myself. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Exploration is in our nature. We began as wonders, and we're wonders still. We have lingered long enough on the shores of the cosmic ocean. We are ready, at last, to set sail for the stars. Good evening and welcome. My name is Daria Whitecastle, and I'd like to present to you my project today. Before we dive in, I want to tell you a quick story about how I found myself here today on the stage in front of you being unapologetically nerdy. So, um, Unlike most people in technology, I haven't always been interested in tech. In fact, my passion was education and languages. So I graduated from a university in Russia with a, uh, with a degree in English and French linguistics and minor in education. A few years later, I found myself working in the higher education industry. I, I worked closely with the emerging strategies and products team um, for a large education provider. It is there that I first realized the power of technology to inspire learning and asked myself the question, what if I could combine my imagination with some of the best technology tools to create a fun and engaging learning experience? So in the past year, I have learned over 100 new technologies and enriched my imagination by some of the best amazing projects uh, made by those in the community. So here's my project inspired by all of you and also Carl Sagan. So my app allows you to become a virtual space traveler uh, and move around the solar system by clicking and dragging the mouse around your screen. You can also click on each planet and find yourself immersed in this virtual world. Uh, if you're interested in learning more facts, this flyout right here will tell you more, um, more information about it. By the way, the, world, uh, the word um, planet comes from Greek term planetes, which means wanderer. So if you like, you can just wander around the solar system and get, uh, get a little lost. If you do actually find yourself lost in the solar system, there is the bottom navigation. So you can uh, use that um, to jump around the solar system and hop to one planet, from one planet to the next. And yes, I am an includer. So Pluto is also a planet um, that is right there. <laughs> Uh, so before working on this project, I did not realize that um, Sun accounts for 99% of the mass of the solar system. It takes Pluto 90,000 days to travel around uh, the Sun. And one of my favorite facts uh, is that uh, one of Jupiter's moons, Io, uh, is officially christened by NASA scientists as, I quote, giant pizza covered in melted cheese and splattered with tomato sauce. Yum. Um, so my main tool for building this project was JavaScript. I used Express to set up my server, and I used um, um, Postgres relational database and Connects RM to store information about each planet. On the front end, I used 3JS, to, um, which is a, a 3D rendering uh, library built on top of WebGL, to create each planet um, animate its orbital and axial rotation, um, add some lights and behind the scenes tricks, and also allow users to experience this in virtual reality. Um, so if you think this app is fascinating as it is, wait till you experience it in virtual reality. Um, so actually it's one of my goals to uh, for this project to create a fully immersive virtual reality experience. I do have first draft, so if you're interested, please do come talk to me after the presentation. I'd love to share it with you. Um, and one of my other goals includes inviting collaboration. I love my project, but if you are equally excited about it, please come talk to me so we can bounce ideas and make this project even better. And in fact, all of you are invited to um, explore this further by going to wondersinteractive.com. I'll pull it up. WondersInteractive.com, and if you'd like to connect with me, please visit me on, Dari on my website, DariaWhitecastle.com, and connect with me on GitHub, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Thank you so much for being here. We have an awesome evening full of really cool presentations. 
Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the evening. All right, how's that? Cool. All right, thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Matthew Moyer, and I'm here to talk to you about my new app, Where the Wild Things Are. Um, so a little about me first. Uh, I'm an English professor turned developer, and I'm a New Yorker turned Coloradan. Uh, <laughs> the uh, coolest thing about moving out to Colorado was the wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, New York, you don't really get any cool wildlife. You get some pigeons, occasional subway rats, nothing really to write home about. Um, but when I moved out to Colorado, I went to Rocky Mountain National Park, and I saw a moose. And it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so the Colorado wildlife is super cool, it's amazing, it's the best in the country, but it is hard to find. Or at least it was. Introducing where the wild things are. Um, so this is an app, we'll do a little video demo. And when you launch the app, it takes you to a menu bar where you have access to a profile or a map view. And we're gonna go ahead and select the map. And this will actually take you to a map of your local area. And each marker on this map represents a different wildlife sighting around your uh, location. And if you click any of the markers, It'll pull up all the information associated with that post. So you can see what was seen, when it was seen, who saw it, a little description, and even an image. Um, another cool thing is if you want to really see one particular species. Danny here's never seen a moose, so now he can go to the drop down, select moose, and now next time he goes camping, he goes hiking, he can see all the locations that people have seen moose before and base his trip around those. Another cool thing is now Danny sees a moose. He's shocked, he's amazed. He clicks this add button, and he can actually share his experience. He picks what he saw, he can put in a little description of what he's seeing. Saw a moose, and it'll, uh, <laughs> it'll actually pull your uh, location based on your phone's GPS coordinates, and you can even upload a custom image, either a live image or one from your files. And when you click Submit here, it'll take you back to the map view. And now anyone who uses this app, anyone who goes on this site, has access to the posting that you just did. Um, another really cool thing is if you click um, this uh, Profile button on the top right, it's going to launch you to a menu. And if you select your sightings from this menu, you can see all of the postings associated with your personal account. So these are all Danny's wonderful sightings. Um, so that's the demo. The biggest challenge I had with this app was how to store data and how to transfer data. Chances are if you're seeing a moose or an elk or a bobcat, you're probably in a location where you don't have great internet service, you don't have great connectivity. So that led me to using progressive web app technologies. And what this enables you to do is store information on your phone, store images, locations, descriptions, and then once you have service again, it will automatically upload this data for anyone in the world to see. Um, on the front end, I use AngularJS framework, and on the back, I used Express. Um, in terms of the future of this app, I'd like to partner with national or state parks. Uh, you can kind of crowdsource different um, locations, different wildlife sightings, even generate heat maps of migration patterns for different animals. Uh, it can also be used to log invasive species around Colorado, which are becoming a huge problem in the parks here. Um, once again, my name is Matthew Moyer, and if you'd like to talk to me about this app, I'll be hanging out in the back after the break. Thanks.
Hello, hello. Thank you, thank you. All right, hi everyone. Thank you for coming here tonight and those of you watching live online. Uh, my name is Thomas Castleman and tonight I'm here to talk to you about my application, Easy Chai. But first I'd like to tell you a bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee and before joining, uh, attending Galvanize, I was a baker actually. I think the most cookies I ever baked in a day was about 2040 and that got old kind of soon so I decided to apply to Galvanize and got in, and now I'm a developer. So uh, some of my hobbies include uh, video and tabletop games, collecting and making music with synthesizers, and cooking. And so, on to my capstone project. Uh, what I wanted to focus on for my capstone was an in-demand and useful technology we had not learned much about in class, uh, test-driven development, which is more of a style of development uh, in which you test things first and then see if your code works. Uh, it's useful and important. It increases the quality of code written and decreases the number of lines of code used uh, in, on average, studies have shown. It's used by major companies such as uh, Google, Yahoo, uh, Yahoo's not a major, never mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Amazon and, uh, okay. So it's uh, slightly challenging to learn and uh, not very widely taught. So the problem I was faced with was how can I make testing easier to learn for people and how can we write tests more easily? So uh, the solution I came up with is Easy Chai, a, uh, it, which makes Mocha Chai testing easy. Let's uh, go to easychai.cafe here and as you can see it is a uh, coding environment where you can type code on the top left corner box and which is then evaluated and you can add different tests from the testing menu over here and the code for those tests will appear in the top left corner and a run test button which shows your results over on the top right and so I'm just going to go ahead and log in and load up an environment I have saved for you guys. Oh, okay. Um, this isn't the environment I remember saving. Uh, it looks like there's an object me that's not ready for a dev job, and a function galvanize that takes a person as an argument, and then does some stuff, and it looks like there's a test down here that says that I need to be ready for a dev job. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and run this test. Uh, it looks like it failed. Um, I'm, I'm really wondering uh, what code I need to write in order for this to pass, but um, does anybody in the audience have a suggestion? Yeah, okay, uh, that sounds like it might work. Uh, let me give that a try. Okay, let's run the test again. Oh, and it looks like it passed. Okay. So that is Easy Chai. It makes Mocha Chai testing easy. So on to some of the technologies I used making Easy Chai. Uh, I most spent most of my time working in Vue and Vueify on the front end, along with uh, this code snippet evaluator with a uh, syntax highlighting and stuff called Clips. I uh, use Mocha and Chai to do the testing on the front end, and the back end is Express, Node, and Postgres with Auth0 in the middle of all of that. Uh, some problems I encountered while developing the app, uh, event handling in Vue, uh, some CSS conflicts, and trying to get the layout optimized. Uh, as for future plans, I want to uh, create command line tools for easy test generation and Node projects, and create a menu for configuring API calls out of the app. Uh, so that is easychai.cafe uh, if you want to visit it and try some testing yourself. 
Uh, thank you so much for being here or watching live, and uh, feel free to contact me via any of these means or come up and talk to me after the presentations. Uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for making it out. And Danny, for all the dry runs that you put us through. Never with the AV equipment, really? No, just kidding. Well, yeah, thank you for taking your time to figure out a little bit about what we've been doing over those last six months, if you haven't seen some of us in a while. Uh, so my name is Paul Torres. Oop. Oh, yep, just getting, getting carried away. So my name is Paul Torres, and I'm a full-stack web developer, along with all the other characters here with us tonight. And uh, just a little bit about me. Prior to starting at Galvanize, I spent about a decade working in financial services in a variety of different capacities. And one of the things that always seemed lacking is the tools were never quite where you wanted them to be. When Google can finish a sentence for you, there was kind of this constant struggle to try to make things work the way you'd want them to in a bit more efficient manner. So that really got my gears turning. I really started to like Salesforce and other tools. And um, at least when it came time to do a capstone, I realized, you know what? I may not be a very good runner, but I really like trail running. Uh, so one of the things I found getting into the sport about a year ago is I would nerd out online uh, searching for all sorts of stuff. And there wasn't a very good central resource. There were a couple of YouTube videos here. There were a couple of podcasts to listen to, like maybe a magazine. And part of what I thought was like, you know, really, we really need a resource that's kind of a curated experience of what some of the best resources are out there on the web for this sport that's kind of niche, but at least in my mind, kind of fun. So what I came up with, or my solution, if you will, was trailrunguide.com. Really an easy to use go-to resource for trail running information. So let me just take you on a little journey over here. For starters, this is anytime you're looking for a trail running location, it's able to use Google Maps and a couple different trail related APIs to find at least five locations nearby that you could get out to, regardless of where you are. And one of the fun things that I got into was you know what? Maybe the world doesn't need a chat bot, another chat bot, but you know what? Why not have one for trail running? Hmm, I wonder where this is going. <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah, so it's fun to make it a little snark in there with the, with the chat bot as well building that out. So in the process of pulling this together, I used a whole series of different technologies. Uh, for one, the, the website was built in uh, Ember. I used WebSockets to correspond with the, the chatbot API from IBM, one of their Watson tools. I also used Firebase, Node, Heroku to deploy the app, as well as the Google Maps APIs as a resource as well. Uh, so yeah, like any project, we all have a little bit of overachievers in us, and there's always more you'd want to do. Uh, so it was really interesting getting into Ember, because if you don't quite understand app architecture, you will when you're trying to build something in Ember. So that did take up a bit of the time. Two, I have a bit of a Salesforce nerd, as a lot of my classmates know. It, it's dry, but it's part of my life. I was trying to incorporate that and then kind of realized that the ways I wanted to do that were all harkening back to uh, YouTube videos from 2015, and they'd, they'd made some changes that you never quite get directly in succinct answers. So that was a lesson in itself. And as well as working with a, a chatbot API, you have to be really structured about what you do, even though it tries to do some of the work for you. 
so that's my project. And going forward, there's a few things that I'd like to add. For one, I'd love to continue to build out the chatbot functionality to be able to do different searches and provide more relevant information above and beyond what it can do now. Uh, I'd also want to set up an email and text notification sign up so that you could receive either via text or email notifications about new content from preferred providers, some of the best YouTube uh, chat type uh, sources out there. And uh, also put together a message board for people to swap ideas of what some of their favorite places are from potentially around the world in case you might be traveling. Uh, so thank you for your time, and that's my project. You can check it out. I have the deployed link or see some of the other fun stuff that I've been up to at uh, torypaul.com. Hey guys, I'm Jordan Stevenson. I'm a full stack web developer here in Galvanize. A little bit about, about, about me. Um, here we are when we actually first started. Um, I went to Oklahoma State University, got my, um, my graduate and under or my master's there as well. Um, I was in, actually in tech sales before I started here, so I actually sold the websites to people. And so I learned enough to be dangerous. And then it kind of got me the bug. And my brother is a website developer as well. And so he kind of prodded me to, to, to get here. And I took the plunge, and I almost, almost never looked back. <laughs> uh, so in, the inspiration behind my app, um, they actually like make you write a letter to your significant other when you join this class, saying that you're not going to have time for chores around the house, laundry. You're just not going to have time for it. So I instantly thought that my husband um, obviously forgets to feed the dogs and even pick up dog food. So, um, and I also, when I'm driving, I also, you know, constantly think, I always pass pharmacies, I'm like, oh, I, I was supposed to stop there, or, you know, just any place I was supposed to stop, and I instantly think uh, I missed it at, right after. So, I, um, my goal for the app was to do a, a to-do list app that notifies you when you're, before you pass a location, to knock off that to-do list. So, behold the app. So what we're going to do, we're going to sign in. There's my, yep. We're going to sign in with our email and password. Sorry for the sound. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have a sign in. So we have verification on that as well. And then we have our squad list. So we have all the people in our squad, and we have our to-do list. So everyone can delete and <laughs> do that. And then we have our squad map. So this is where our notifications come in. So we're going to take, so right now, it's, it's taking our um, location right now. And then say my roommate, he lives over there, and he needs to pick up something. You'll, you'll see. Um, so we set our, our notification there. And then we, let's do our radius like 2,000. So that radius over there. And then we're going to say, more cake. I want more cake, obviously. <laughs> and then we tag it with a bakery. So then we're going to, he needs to do that pretty soon. Because I want cake. Um, and then so we have our location. So anytime he's in that uh, radius, he's actually going to get a notification saying that he has, he's in this radius and he could pick up um, something that can knock off his to-do to list. And then we also have the squad portal. So this will show up all your squads and what they're supposed to do. So problems and counters, obviously there are always problems. Um, I learned a brand new language for this, which was Swift, which was, you know, something else. Um, geolocation notification testing was pretty hard, just because I couldn't test it, like, right then, um, just to make sure, like, when I at, went outside the boundaries, I actually got a no notification. And then real-time data. Uh, the technologies I used was Swift, Firebase, um, Google Maps API, and Xcode. Future plans, of course. Um, I would love to do, like, voice recognition, so when I actually talk to the app, um, it could add a to-do list for your squad. 
a photo recognition, taking a picture of your to-do list and then adding it to your squad. And then um, it, it's obviously an Apple right now, but cro uh, making an, uh, an Android would be fun as well. And thanks so much. My name is Jordan Stevenson, and my portfolio and email and GitHub is all up here. So thank you guys so much. <laughs>
find him on a map and find the houses that he had available. Uh, and another issue that he had was actually receiving uh, applications any other way other than uh, like hard copies, like coming down to his office and actually filling a piece of paper out. So that brought us to uh, creating his website for J&R Properties. So here I am, I'm, a, I'm moving to a new location, I need to find a place to live so I can actually go through the application and look for a different place to live. You can actually see the houses on the maps and then find out some more information about a particular property. So this house, you know, it's, you can contact the realtor here, find more information out and details and more pictures about the, about the house. So let me see if I can find a house that I'd like to live in. This looks like a pretty good house, right? <laughs> so plenty of bedrooms, a lot of office space. <laughs> you, you can actually uh, contact the realtor here. Or, and if this is the house that you want to apply to, you can actually fill out an application online for this property. And of course, reading the long disclaimer that of course we uh, all know we all read every time we f fill out an application. And we can submit that form right there. So some of the technologies that I use for this, pro this uh, website uh, was really focused around Angular 4. Uh, I spent a lot of time learning that. It was, it was something new for me. Angular 4 actually uses uh, TypeScript. I use Bootstrap for the stylings, uh, as well as uh, ExpressNode uh, server. Uh, Google Maps API for uh, dropping the pins and seeing the locations of the houses on the maps, uh, as well as Amazon S3 Web Services for actually storing the images. So some of the issues that I have with this problem, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, S3, as well as the Angular 4 uh, HTTP stuff, does not have a lot of documentation or tutorials available for it. So uh, with all the struggles that I actually have with this problem, uh, I'm actually going to make some tutorials on my own, some video tutorials for myself in the future, as well as other developers to actually come behind and be able to make it easier for them in the future. Uh, also, converting physical addresses to latitude and longitudes uh, to drop the pins on the maps was, was a little difficult. Uh, some future features that I want to uh, implement for this. Uh, be able to pay application fees online so you don't have to actually go to an office and bring a check or whatever the case may be. Using a third-party processor like PayPal. Uh, tenants can actually log in and see what their account you know, is due or how they stand uh, or pay their rents online. Uh, the realtor would be able to actually text or email uh, the, the tenants for things that needed, you know, services to the house or, or if they're late on rent or anything like that. And of course, monetize the site. Again, my name is John Scheffler. Uh, you can see my portfolio site at johnsheflerjr.com as well as uh, email me at john.shefflerjr at gmail. And as I progress with this application, feel free to check it out at jnrpropertiesrentals.com. Thank you. <laughs>
So my oldest goes to high school now, and so I thought it was the best time to come back to coding, but I had to know all the latest and the greatest stuff, and Galvanize was definitely an easy choice. So um, like I said, I am a full stack web developer, but uh, and so I've been coming to class every single day, morning to night, for the last six months. When I'm at home, I'm busy shuttling the kids around, maybe taking care of the dog. I also like to you know, talk in meetups, go to hackathons. So as you, like, you, know, you can see how busy the weekday gets for me. And so in our household, everything, all the chores, everything happened in the weekend. So during the week, I keep remembering all these things that I have to accomplish in the weekend. And then the weekend appears, and I have no recollection of what I want to do. So I needed help with that. And that's what got me to my capstone project. So what I decided was that I needed, I was going to do, um, I was going to use Amazon Echo and have a customized skill that would manage my grocery list, manage my chore list, and of course manage my short-term memory problem. So, <laughs> so here's a brief demo. Alexa, open my list helper. You have one to do. Oh. Fruits. Oh shit! It's because it's because of the. We pulled out the plug. So, um, you know, <laughs> rebooting is going to take some time, but let me see. Let me try one more time. If not, I have a video set for you. So, let me try. Alexa, open my list helper. I think so. Something is happening. There was a problem with the requested skills response. Yeah. OK, I'm just going to show you the video. Luckily, I have that all planned out. So so this is what she's supposed to do. And she's been really good at it. So don't blame her. Yeah. you can see she's not really a helper she's my lifelong friend too so <laughs> so this is how it looks on the you know on the front end but the way the back end works is when i give the amazon echo a voice command um, the amazon echo sends it to alexa skill kit alexa skill kit in return turns the voice command to text and sends it to lambda lambda is the one talking to the database to the email service forms a response sends a text response back to Alexa, and she in turn gets the audio response, and then we get the voice response back. So that's how it's working. The technologies I've used for this are Alexa Skill Kit, Lambda, DynamoDB, SES for emailing, JavaScript, Node.js, and AWS. For the future, I would love for her to be more time sensitive as well, um, when it, she can remind me of what I need to do when. Um, and also, I'm really very hopeful that it's going to go to the Alexa Skill Store and also maybe expand it further to every family member. So that was my uh, skill. And my name, again, is Anita Kedkar. This is my contact information. I would love to be in touch with you. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. 
Thanks for coming. My name is Ryan Johnson, and I want to take a few minutes to tell you about my new app called Challenge Accepted. Uh, but first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a full stack developer finishing up at Galvanize. I like to produce music and DJ in my spare time. And I have a background in accounting and finance. But after a few years, I decided that I needed a new challenge in my life. And that's where Challenge Accepted comes in. So that got me thinking, how many of you have a personal goal or a skill in particular that you want to achieve? Yep. Uh, and how many of you enjoy com competition or competing with others? Awesome, me too. Uh, and sometimes you just want something to do, but you don't know what to do and you just need that extra push to like go out and be active. And that's where Challenge Accepted comes in. So let's take a look at it and see it in action. So if you go to the app, you can log in, and once you log in, you will be presented with a list of user-created challenges. So let's find one that looks interesting. Hmm, go on a hike in the Rocky Mountains, that looks fun. So here, I can see the details for this particular challenge. Let's join this one. And then below, you can see a list of all of the users associated with this challenge. And then in the submission, submissions tab, you can see, oh, I guess there's no submissions. Let's create one. So I will create a submission. Let's pick this picture of me climbing a mountain. And then in details, what a view. And then I'll click Submit. And then this will upload the content to my cloud storage uh, via Cloudinary. And then once it's uploaded, I can go to the Submissions tab, and there's my submission. And this is where it gets fun. So now I can vote on which submission I like. Obviously, there's only one, and it's mine. It's the best one. So I will vote on this one. And then once I vote on it, that user's submission score is then updated, as well as the challenger, the challenger creators challenge score. And say I find a challenge that I really enjoy, I can share it with my favorite social network and then encourage my friends or other people to also take the challenge. From here, I can also chat with the other users in this challenge in real time via WebSockets. Uh, no one else is online though. I can go to my, cha my challenges page and see all of the challenges that I am participating in as well as the status of whether I've submitted something to it and my score. Some challenges that I, or uh, technologies I used were, were Angular 4 using TypeScript and Bootstrap for the front end as well as WebSockets via Socket.io for the real-time chat and the real-time voting. And then for uploading my content online, I use Cloudinary to store my images and videos. On the back end, I use Postgres to store my personal, or for my user information. And that was hosted on Heroku, as well as my front end was hosted on Firebase. Challenges that I encountered for this were the providing the real-time chat and voting. And I used WebSockets, which was a little difficult, but I ended up figuring it out and it, was, it definitely paid off. And then storing content online where I could retrieve it later without storing it in my database. And I used Cloudinary for that. And then going forward, I would, I've started implementing a leaderboard service, or a leaderboard so you can check your score against other users and see how well you rank up against them. I also want to add a geolocation for each challenge, so you can search for challenges in your area and maybe even find users that uh, have similar interests. <clears throat> Furthermore, I would like to create private groups so that you can create challenges amongst your friends and create that healthy competition amongst each other. Because everyone loves, you know, one-upping your friends, right? Yeah. So I encourage you to take the challenge at takethechallenge.net. And my name is Ryan Johnson. You can reach me at ryanj89 at gmail.com or my portfolio at ryanjohnson.com. Thank you.
That's how it works. All right. Is this working? Okay, cool. All right, we're good. Okay. How's it going, everyone? My name is Tom Karep. I'm a full stack web developer here at Galvanize. Um, so, a little bit about me. I uh, graduated from Academy of Art University um, with a degree in illustration. I also played Division II golf there, and I really wanted to uh, combine those two things that I love um, and mer merge them to create better and more useful things, right? So, that kind of led me here to Galvanize, where I became a full stack web developer. So, uh, the question I want to ask you is how is data usually visualized? Um, it's normally one of two ways. Um, the first one being very boring, which would be Excel spreadsheets. Um, the second one, which is kind of boring, <laughs> a graph, right? So for my project, I wanted to make sure that, the, um, that my project was actually more engaging and more interactive. So let's jump right in. Give it a sec, here we go. All right, so this is a 3D globe. I rendered it in 3JS. Um, let's see, let's zoom in. Right, so it actually has the lights on the dark side, as you can see. It also has, um, it fades in and out depending on where the sun position is. Um, we also have um, markers on the map. Um, I'm about to show you those. Let's go to one in Abu Dhabi, right? These uh, are actually, just, just so let me explain what these are. These are the top 50 golf courses in the world, right? Mapped by latitude and longitude on a 3D sphere, which was kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, so when you click one of these points, it zooms in. As you see, this is Abu Dhabi. This is actually the golf course. And uh, it has some information about the course. And it also has um, the ranking up at the top right. And then let's go check out something else. Let's go check out the one in Florida. All right, so it, it really is a good tool to, I guess, even if you're not into golf, it's kind of fun to spin the globe around, first of all. Um, second of all, it's cool just to see like what it looks like and what kind of terrain that each course is like located in. And then, yeah, well, I want to show you guys one more. So we got one in Nebraska here, right? Which is pretty surprising. But, <laughs> but if you guys didn't have a reason to go visit Nebraska, which you probably didn't, now you do. <laughs> All right, so let's go jump back to my slides. Uh -huh. So technologies I use for this. Um, AngularJS, 3JS and WebGL on the front end. Um, Firebase is hosting on the front end. And then also Node, Connects, uh, Postgres, and then Heroku for the back end. Okay, problems encountered. Um, mapping the data on the sphere was pretty difficult, especially in the 3D space. Um, also the city lights, just to get them um, to correlate with the uh, pos position of the sun was also pretty difficult. But I was able to overcome those, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, and the, as far as the future of this app, um, I would like the ability to switch between the top 50 courses and the top 50 players, the view on the map, and also uh, link players to courses based on tournaments that the players may have won. Um, so, yep, that's my project. My name is Tom Krep again. Um, you can go and check out my project at 3dgolfglobe.com. Um, if you want to check out the app itself uh, on my computer, I'll be in the back. Thanks, guys. So that's the way through the night. We don't want to wear We still have eight amazing presentations for you. Right now, we'd like to take a brief intermission and be back at 6.45. Trust me, I'll be yelling at you to get back to me by then. Uh, in the meantime, there is still some muscles out there. Don't be afraid of those. Please feel free to freshen up on refreshments and whatnot. The restroom is to the left around the podium. For those of you tuning in live, we'll be back shortly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Joanne have to show this thing on? Yes. All right, everyone, can you find a seat? Find a seat. Okay. All right, great. Hopefully, everyone got a chance to use the restroom, get those refreshments. There's some incredible possibility that it happens to jump on your shirt, so watch out for that one. Um, not kidding. So, yeah, we're about to roll into our last set of presentations, but trust me, you're in for a treat. If you've ever bought any groceries in your life, you want to pay close attention to this next app. So, without further ado, we can jump the bill. This on? Yep. Good. Okay. Hi there. My name is Bill Bouton. I am a full stack software developer. I actually got my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from California State Chico. And I've been in technology sales for the past six years. And I actually came to Galvanize to get back into my kind of engineering roots. So a couple months ago, my wife were actually at Costco and we're walking down the aisle and we go, I know we need either refried beans or black beans. So as we're going there, we're still kind of discussing, you know, do you know which one we have? Do I know which one we have? Neither one of us really know. And of course, we're at Costco, so if you buy something, you better be committed because you're getting 12 of them. <laughs> so as we're walking down, we go, no, definitely, we, we definitely need black beans. And sure enough, we buy black beans, we get home, and we already have a pack of 12 black beans and no refried beans. So now we are fully stacked in black beans for a year. So I thought, I, th I can fix this, um, and Pantry Supply is the solution. So I'll go to a quick demo. So here is the home screen to the iOS app on Pantry Supply. As you can see, it shows all the items currently in your pantry and the quantity associated with each. If I scroll down, I can see bananas highlighted in red. It looks like I have zero, so I need to make sure to pick that up at the store. And if I go and click in one, say Cliff Bars, I see I currently have four in stock. Um, and it, below, you can see the days that I purchased and the days that I removed them from my pantry. And it gives me the average days, so I know, all right, I'm at the store, I have X quantity left, and, I, and they only last a day. Maybe I need to get one, maybe I don't. This at least gives you the information to know that. So when I'm at the store, I'm looking at this app, and I go, okay, this is what I currently have. These are a few things I need. As I come home, I bring my shopping items home. So here's my shopping items of the day. Uh, and I come over to my, so this is a Raspberry Pi. It's a little computer here, uh, and it's hooked up to a barcode scanner. There's two buttons here, one for in, one for out. So if I, let's show an example of the clip bar. This is a clip bar here, it's currently at four. If I press the in button, scan the item, refresh the app real quick, you can see the clip bar then went to five. So you continue on, you scan in the rest of your items, and you go, you know what, I actually bought, uh -oh. I actually bought bananas today. So I'm going to come in here, I'm going to go, you know, I bought five bananas because bananas don't have barcodes. So now my banana count is accurate. But you go, wait a minute, here's an apple, this doesn't have a barcode either. So you simply come and add, and you say, this is a golden apple. I bought three of these today. So I add it, and it's now there at the bottom of my list. So, <laughs> so a couple days later, I'm going on a hike, and I want to grab a clip bar on my way out. So I essentially press the out button on the Raspberry Pi, scan the item, and again, refresh it. And now my clip bar's quant quantity is now at four. So it accurate in real time updates how many items are in your fridge, the quantity, uh, and the per recently purchased states. So the technologies I used for this, uh, the app was built in Swift. Uh, I used Python to write the Raspberry Pi script and also the server environment. I used Flask as the server uh, the server web application. I used Heroku to host it. The Raspberry Pi is the actual computer you see here, and MongoDB was a database. Uh, of course, I had issues. Uh, Swift, I learned this from the ground up, so in two weeks I had to learn how to build an app. Uh, it was difficult, absolutely, but it paid off in the end because I do like working with it now. 
the Raspberry Pi I had to do some uh, operating ish or operating system configurations uh, to be able to run this the way I wanted to, which is something I was not familiar with before, so I had to learn that. The images API, I'm sorry, the API for the uh, uh, for the barcode items don't have images unless I wanted to pay a lot of money, so I'll do that in the future. And Flask is uh, has some deployment issues initially with Flask. So in the future, I am looking to build out an Android app as well, so I can kind of capture the whole mobile market, as well as integrate Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to the Raspberry Pi so that you can configure it via your uh, uh, mobile iOS app. And then also have user login so we can actually release this to the public so they can configure their own environment. And then also have multiple devices. So have multiple Raspberry Pi's computers with barcode scanners so you can put them on your pantry, your fridge, your garage, your kitchen, so you can have a full look at all the items in your house. So my name is Bill Bouts and this is Pantry Supply. Thank you very much. What's it doing? Oh, it changed. <laughs> All right. So good evening. Thanks for coming and checking out our capstones. My name is Nick Sugar. I am a full stack web developer. And there we go. Uh, I'm also a skydiver. And at one time, I was a student pilot. So everybody loves the flying part, and nobody loves the academic part. Um, having to go through manual after manual, it's kind of dusty, and um, kind of wish that there was a more interactive way to learn the academic portion. So that's why I came up with Aviator's app. So let's say Danny, our friend Danny here, is a new pilot, and he's trying to study. So he can go and check out aviatorsapp.com. And the cool thing is you can add uh, the app, like an icon, to your home screen which makes it you know, exactly like a regular application, except you don't have to download it. Um, so that's definitely like a, a cool like web app technology or a progressive web app technology. Um, also, once you've gone to the site a couple times, it'll give you a little pop-up at the bottom that'll offer to add it to your home screen for you. Um, so to sign in, um, to get like the full actual features of everything, it's, pretty, it's super easy to sign in with Google or Facebook. Uh, once you've signed in, Danny is able to check out the aircraft, different manuals and stuff, and different lessons to, to uh, try. So here are the aircraft menu of lessons to check out. So he decides he wants to learn about the GoBot 700. So he's going to go and he's going to check out the first lesson. Uh, right off the bat, there's like sections of like the actual like key points of the lessons. Um, kind of instructions down here at the bottom, he's going to see a PDF reader to where he's able to, it'll start you on the right page for the lesson. He's able to go through every page he needs um, with the instructions on top. So after he's been studying for a while, there's a flashcard uh, feature, which is taking the new, like, um, I mean, it's been around for a while, but the um, space learning to which is nice, what's nice about this also is that it's not like a, like a multiple choice type thing. It actually makes you know that you have to actually know it. And then it's kind of like you have to tell it whether or not you got it right or not. Um, all of this is also being saved on your phone. So instead of having to download the app, it actually does this for you. Like it saves it to your local storage on your phone. So you can use this anywhere. So he can be checking out these flashcards anywhere he's at at any time. 
So some of the technologies I used uh, for the offline portion, for like service workers and manifest, all that stuff to make it feel like an actual regular application without actually having to download it. On the front end, I used Angular and Angular Material. The back end was Express and Connects, and then Auth0 for the like sign-on portion. Um, some of the problems and solutions that I ran into was getting the Auth0, Service Workers, and Angular all to work together, having to be able to save all that stuff offline, saving to your phone to where you can use it wherever. Also, the Anki algorithm that has to do with like the space learning for like the flashcards, um, there's stuff online that you can use, but there's nothing really that usable for me to be able to integrate it into the app, so I kind of had to make that up as I went along. But with enough you know, research and stuff, I could kind of reverse engineer it. For the future, um, the next versions would have a flight planner and GPS. So you could actually track your flight and maybe fly around and actually you know, be able to show you where you are at the time. Also, a weight and fuel calculator that would help you um, learning that portion of your test, like being able to calculate the, obviously, weights and fuels for each flight. Uh, once again, my name is Nick Sugar. I'm a full stack web developer. I will be working out of Seattle, Washington. Feel free to contact me, email me, uh, call or text, check out my portfolio site, and check out aviatorapp.com. Thank you very much. sing me off stage. Good. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Lane Faison. I am a full stack web developer and an iOS developer. Uh, a little bit about my background. I am a United States Marine Corps infantry veteran. Um, I graduated from the University of Colorado Boulder with a degree in mathematics. Um, I, I'm an also a fitness enthusiast. I love going to the gym. I love running. Um, I love losing to my fiance in the Boulder Boulder. Um, <laughs> and this app helped kind of inspire me, uh, or this, that helped inspire me to build the app that I'm here to show you guys today. Uh, so the problems um, that a lot of people encounter in the fitness industry is how many of you would love to build a super regimented uh, diet plan where you have to weigh all your food, uh, use lots of Tupperware, come up with these elaborate uh, workout plans where you track every single thing you do in the gym? Anybody? More than I thought, but most of you know. For the average gym goer, this stuff is not fun, and usually you will burn out after about three days of doing it, and then you're back to square one. Uh, so my app ho hopefully will solve that problem. So without further ado, I will introduce you to my iPhone application, MaxTrax. We're going to come to the login screen here. Finally, a fitness app that makes tracking all your goals easy and in one place, let's get started. So let's say you want to track how, you, how your progress is, in, how, what your progress is looking like in the gym. So we're going to go to view goals here. We're going to check out the lifting section. You've been really working on that barbell shoulder press. You're currently sitting at 95 pounds, but you want to, you want to update that because you just put up a whopping, let's say you met your goal, 135 pounds. You're going to go ahead and save that, bam. Your goal immediately updates on the page. Let's say you did some running as well. Go into the running section here. You can see all your previous times. And then just like uh, with the lifting section, you can update your goal there as well. And let's say you want to keep tabs on how often you go to the gym. Someone doesn't believe that you go to the gym a lot, so you want to, you want to use this app to prove to them that you go there all the time. So you can go to this visit section it will show you that you've been to the gym four times so far in June, but how does it actually know that you've been to the gym? We're going to go back to the menu screen here. Currently, the gym is set to Lifetime Fitness, but 
I'm slick. I'm just going to pretend I went there anyways. I'm going to go ahead and check in using uh, data location. That shows that I am not at the gym and I will not actually get any credit for that. <laughs> but we're going to set the gym to here at Galvanize. We're going to use that little thing they call a gym in the back. We're going to go ahead and check in, and you are checked in. Have a great workout. And then if you go back to your view goal section, go to your visits, you'll see now you are up to five visits. Also, you want to keep track of your diet, but like I said, you don't want the crazy meal plans. You just want simple things like how many fruits did I eat in June or how many vegetables did I eat. So we're going to go into the fruit section, and bam, we got fruit here, vegetables. We're going to log a fruit here, but... This app is too smart for you. You cannot cheat it. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and test this out and see if I actually did eat this fruit, or at least planning to eat this fruit. Drum roll, please. We have a fruit. <laughs> but I'm really smart. I hate vegetables, but I'm just going to pretend that this orange is a vegetable, and we're going to go ahead and, and store my vegetable or orange into my vegetable section. No, that is not a vegetable. <laughs> and that is Max Tracks. So I'll go back to my slides here. So tech notes. Uh, this, this app was written uh, entirely in Swift 3 with the use of Cocoa Pods, uh, Core Data for storing all your information as well as Core Location. Uh, for the GPS tracking. Uh, the environment, it was built entirely in Xcode 8. I used Google Place or Google Cloud Vision API for the object recognition, uh, as well as Google Places to help locate uh, your gym. Uh, the big problems I encountered when I originally built this app, um, I had designed it visually to fit for the iPhone 7, which is the one in the middle here. Uh, then when I ran it on the iPhone 7 Plus, in the iPhone 5, I found that it was a little, the, visually things were, were not quite lying up right, so I had to go back and refactor all the visualization, but now, as you can see, it looks great across uh, all the different devices. And the other problem was mobile. This is a web development course. This is not a mobile development course, so everything that I had to learn for this app was brand new. Swift is not taught here. Xcode is not taught here. Uh, you know, the instructors don't know it. They're able to help me out here and there a little bit, but this is, this is pretty much, I was on an island having to learn this one myself. Um, and that, that was a lot of fun. Galvanize does a great job at, at uh, teaching us to teach ourselves. So um, this was a great example of that. Uh, future implementations. Um, I would love to come out with new versions and new features of this app. Also, Xcode 9 was just released. It's in beta form. Uh, once it's completely released uh, to the public, I'd like to refactor this into Swift 4. Um, and also, with every iOS developer, uh, the ultimate goal is to get this uh, out into the App Store. Um, and I'm pleased to announce, as of about 48 hours ago, my app is now live in the iTunes App Store. So feel <laughs> Thank you. Feel free to download this right now if you'd like. Um, and also, one of my students, or fellow students, Anita, just informed me that through her daughter, uh, who is studying abroad right now, my application is already being spread around Japan. <laughs> uh, here's all my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me, and thank you very much. Hello? Can you hear me? It's like a weird echo. <laughs> I 
and one one seven. Aha! Success. All right. How are y'all doing? <laughs> Uh, hello guys, I'm Lewis Antweiler, and I'm here to present to you peanut butter. Uh, so before I get into that, um, who, I, who am I? Uh, well, I'm a developer and a musician, and I graduated from CU in 2015 with a degree in English and creative writing. Um, today I'll be focusing more on my developer and musician sides. Uh, so I have this problem. Um, as an improvisational musician, I found it hard to find backing tracks that I could uh, easily jam to. If I wanted a key, and I wanted to specifically jam in a specific key, um, it was hard to find enough tracks that would keep it unique. Um, also, if I wanted to learn a key by ear, it was hard to find tracks that wouldn't inform me of the key. Uh, also, there was no easy way to get going on a music project. If I was starting a new project and I just wanted drums or bass or something, I didn't have an easy way to get going. So that's when I created Peanut Butter. Drum roll, please. <laughs> I give to you Peanut Butter. Uh, so this is a procedural music generator. Um, you can hear the bass and drums in there. Um, if I wanted to mute, now I just got the dr uh, just just the bass there. And if I wanted just the drums, I could do just the drums. Um, and if I wanted to say play in a specific key, I could choose a key like C. And if I wanted a mode of major, I could do major. Um, you say, hey, Lewis. I only play in Locrian, some bizarre mode. Uh, you can do that. With this app, you can choose Locrian and create a track. You can also set the tempo and choose uh, a wave. If you liked it enough, you could download it and save it as an MP3 file. So let's call it uh, Galvanize Song and save that. Um, and I can also upload it. Song Galvanize, and then click the Upload button. Also, if I wanted to download other tracks that other people have uploaded, I can do that here. Um, so I like this Wonkify. That sounds cool. I'm going to check that out, download it, and I'll save it. And now it is saved. Um, so how did I build this app? Uh, so I for my database needs. Uh, now everyone's favorite part, math. Just kidding. Uh, but I did it just from an algorithm. Um, so in the future, I'm planning on adding a midsection so you don't just have bass and drums. Um, I'm actually actually currently working on uh, midsection. It should be up later, so be sure to check it out. Uh, no editing and DAW functionality so that you can use it like a regular recording software and machine learning to uh, improve the algorithm that makes the music, uh, so you'll get better music every time. Um, so why is it called peanut butter? Because every jam needs peanut butter. <laughs> I'm Lewis Antweiler. Uh, you can check out the project, uh, download it at jamtopeanutbutter.com uh, or check out more of my stuff at lewisantweiler.com. Uh, thanks. <laughs>
Check, check. No? Okay. That's fine. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Brad Folkers. I am a uh, full stack developer, a uh, finance nerd, and I'm uh, here to tell you about a little app that I made called Economist. <laughs> All right, so a little b before I get into that, a little bit about myself, uh, my background. About four years ago, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin uh, with a bachelor's in economics. Uh, moved to Colorado, uh, worked a couple of years in uh, uh, consumer lending and uh, financial regulatory consulting. Uh, but uh, coding had always been my biggest passion, so I did a little bit of a career pivot. Uh, went back to school, got my associate degree in computer science. Went straight into Galvanize, and uh, over the past six months, I've learned a vast array of uh, different languages and frameworks. Um, and in about four weeks, I will be starting a new career uh, making financial software. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, I've gone full circle from uh, a personal banker who uses financial software to a software developer who makes financial software. And it was uh, combining these two loves of mine that I thought of the idea for Economist. Um, so do you ever have the, the same repetitive tasks that you're doing again and again, and you wish that you could uh, have a way to automate them? Uh, I know as a finance nerd, uh, that's how I felt about uh, checking stock values. I would go to Yahoo Finance's homepage every single day, uh, type the same stock ticker uh, symbols into the search bar again and again, and I just got sick and tired of it, so I decided to take uh, matters into my own hands. Um, so let's uh, dive into the app. Um, so we'll uh, go through the experience of the uh, typical user. We'll call her Barb. Uh, so Barb is going to log into the app. She'll go straight to the My Stock list, uh, which can also be accessed via the menu. She's going to go to the Individual Stock page, uh, which uh, uses three different APIs for real-time stock data. On the top, we have the uh, company name, price, and change. Uh, then we have a uh, chart, real-time stock data, as well as an RSS feed on the bottom with diff uh, that will pull up an in-app browser and go to that website within the app uh, to go to that news article. Uh, going back to the stock page, um, Barb is now going to click unfollow. She's going to go back to her stock list, and Tesla is no longer on there. Uh, similarly, uh, she can go back to the search stocks page, uh, type in uh, either a symbol or a company, she chose Netflix, uh, so we're going to go to the Netflix uh, stock page. And uh, now she's going to press the uh, follow button, go back to the My Stock list, and now right there at the bottom is Netflix. Uh, so that's it for Barb. She's going to log out now. All right. Uh, so the technologies I used for Economist uh, were uh, Ionic for a, uh, the SDK for a hybrid mobile app. I used AngularJS for my front-end model view controller framework. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, uh, SAS for uh, styling, Firebase for user authentication and uh, database storage, and all of this being wrapped up in the Node.js runtime. Uh, so a little bit about the challenges that I faced making this app. Uh, first and foremost was uh, juggling multiple new frameworks at the same time. I had never made a hybrid app before. Um, uh, specifically, I, a SAS gave me a little bit of trouble because I don't have the greatest design eye, as you can see from these slides. Um, so also, uh, Firebase uh, recently had a massive update, so not a lot of uh, literature available for debugging uh, their new uh, system. And, uh, but I overcame all those challenges and made my first ever mobile app. Um, so what does the future hold for Economist? Uh, I'd like to, first and foremost, I'd like to add a social element uh, where users can uh, use their portfolios to compete against other users. Uh, springboarding off of that, uh, gamification, whereby uh, users can uh, uh, achieve uh, certain uh, badges uh, based on their the performance benchmarks they hit with their stocks. Um, and then a little bit further down the line, I'd like to partner with external services, uh, such as financial advisors and online stock trading services. Probably going to need a legal department before I get there. Um, but uh, you can contact me via my email, uh, personal website, LinkedIn, GitHub, or Slack. Uh, again, my name is Brad Folkers. This is Economist, and thank you very much.
All right, can everyone hear me? All right, cool. <laughs> All right. My name is Ryan Phillips, and I'm a web developer here at Galvanize. Uh, I'm a Denver, Colorado native, born and raised. Uh, I'm also a sports fanatic. I love pretty much every sport. Uh, I'm also a big fan of all the Colorado teams, um, namely the Broncos and the Avalanche. Uh, I'm outdoorsy. I like camping, I like biking, boating, and I like sitting on patios at breweries, which I think counts. And uh, I'm a passionate traveler as well. I like to go everywhere I can and see everything I can. And that's actually what inspired my app. So if you're at all like me, you've probably seen really cool places in movies or seen pictures uh, that friends took on an awesome vacation. Um, or maybe you've just heard about really cool cities and you think to yourself, I'm going to add that to my list. But the problem is you don't have a list. And so after a while, you have so many things that you're trying to remember, you end up forgetting half of them. And then you end up going on vacation and completely forget to go see the giant Buddha when you're actually in Hong Kong and just a few miles away, which may or may not have happened to me. <laughs> so let me show you about my app. Uh, wait for it. All right, so when you first click on the app, it comes to this landing page here where you're prompted to use Touch ID. So I'm going to use my thumbprint to get into the app. Next, it goes to this menu here where you can, I can either go to my bucket list or I can go to my map. For now, I'm going to go to my bucket list. So here you can see a list of, of places that I've added here that I eventually want to see. Uh, some of them I have seen. The ones with a picture and a date are ones that I've already crossed off. So I'm going to click on this one here. It goes to an expanded view where you can see a picture. You can see a date, location, and some notes that I've added. If I want to edit or delete anything, I just click the Edit button at the top. I can change the picture if I want to. I can play with the date or I can adjust the notes. So I'm just going to add a few exclamation points here. Save as completed. Now, I've actually been to the Great Wall now, so at the top of the list, I'm going to click on that. As you can see, there's no picture, there's no uh, date, there's no notes. So I'm going to hit the Edit button, and I can actually select a picture from the, the pictures that I took there. So I'm going to find a good one here real quick. That one looks good. So I'm going to add that on there, change the date, and add some notes. China is cool. And I'm going to hit Save as Completed. So what that's going to do is going to take the information from those few fields there. And it's actually going to go back to my bucket list here. So now you can see at the bottom, it's been checked off. It has a date and a picture. Um, if I want to add a new one, I can actually hit the plus sign up at the top. And uh, for a while now, I've really been wanting to go to Machu Picchu. So I think I'm going to try that one out. So I'm going to start typing Machu. Uh-oh. Well, oh, it's because I turned off the location there. So it actually auto-completes, and it'll add it to the list as well up at the top here. Um, if I go back out, I can go to my map, which uh, would also work if I had my location turned on. Oh, there it goes. But it's supposed to center on my location here, and it will actually show all the different places that I've added to my bucket list. So that's the app. The uh, technologies that I use are Swift, Xcode, and I also use the Google Maps API and the uh, Google Places API. Um, some problems that I ran into, other than turning my geolocation off here, uh, was the authorization um, for a while. It took me quite a while to get past that, but as you can see, I could use the uh, thumbprint and actually get into the app. Um, I also had trouble centering locations, not just today, but in general, uh, but I was able to get through that uh, just fine, trust me. And uh, future plans for the app, I would like to build a web version. Um, I'd also like to be able to check items off with object recognition. So if you're at the Eiffel Tower and you take a picture of it, it recognizes it and checks it off. And I would also like to in in integrate with Instagram so that you can view the pictures you've taken or upload straight from there. And that's my app. My name again is Ryan Phillips. <laughs> you can contact me through email, LinkedIn, GitHub, <laughs> or you can go to ryanophillips.com. Thank you.
It always changes on me. I'm pretty sure it's trying to mess with me. Um, how you guys doing? My name is Jeff Hernandez. <laughs> I'm Sue. <laughs> I am very excited to talk to you about my project today. It's evolved into something very special to me. Uh, it combines two things I love, which is coding and sociology. Before I get into that, however, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was actually raised in Texas. I lived there for about 20 years. I moved up here specifically for the program. My brother went through it, and he was like, hey, you should come live on my couch. It's going to be awesome. You know, go through the program. I'll help you. So I was like, oh, man, this is going to be awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> so I uh, started delivering packages, making some extra money, sold my car, sold my musical equipment, came up here, and spent probably the best issues of my life. So let me tell you about my website. It's called Research Fear Guide, and it's basically a resource for social science students to build comprehensive research projects. I first noticed a need for this when I was in my undergraduate and uh, get it in sociology. And I noticed um, professors who assign students research projects, but not thoroughly go through how to do them. Um, and this was either because they assumed that they learned about it in a previous class, or we just didn't have time to go over it as thoroughly as we wanted to. So a lot of times these students would get these research projects and be like, I have no idea how to construct an interview, a focus group, ethnography, how do I do this? So I thought it would be amazing if we had this website that would take you to start to finish through the entire process. And that is essentially my website. So we need a research question. This is a bit of a mock question. We're going to take what influence have coding schools have on alumni professional careers? So this will be our mock question for our mock research project. So let's go through my website. Wrong direction. All right, so we're going to jump in, get started. Right here it says we haven't created any projects yet. That's because we haven't logged in. So we're going to log in with a username I previously created. Once we sign in, we'll see we have two projects under, um, over here. But we don't really care about those. We want to start a new one. So we can do this from scratch, or we can start from a category. We're going to choose interview, and this is going to take you to some subtypes. We have unstructured, semi-structured, and structured. This will tell you about the pros and cons, some of the benefits, and when you want to use them. Semi-structured is good for, good for this one. So this is going to take an overview, give us a little more detail on semi-structured. This will tell us about the questions and how to format them, how to, how to create them. It may seem easy, but people spend months or weeks you know, on these. And so here we're going to create it. We're going to put in some demographic information. This is just going to remind us what we want to get from the participants. What, what do we want to know about them? So like resident location, that's good. Income is good. So this is the meat. We're actually going to create the project here. So we'll put in a project title, and this is more for our purposes. We're going to call it Coding School Influence on Professional Career. And this is so we can reference this later. So this is a little blurb telling us we're going to give you some suggestions for what your questions should be, but pre feel free to deviate them if you feel like you should. So our first question is going to be very open-ended. What do you enjoy most about coding? And see, on the, on the right side, we see that we should, it's suggesting we'll make it open-ended and comfortable so we can kind of ease into the conversation. The second question, could you tell me about your experience after graduation? So we're going to stop there, and we're going to save this. We can see the project was totally saved. And if we go back home, we can see now that our project is saved. It's now under a project. And we're free to go in and edit that, modify it, delete it, whatever we want. So that's essentially the workflow of my website. So some of the obstacles I encountered was I really wanted to do this with Angular 4, but a huge problem I had, a huge obstacle, is I didn't know Angular 4. So I want to do this in the right way. So I know with front-end frameworks, there's a lot of wrong ways to do a lot of great things. And I wanted to learn the right way. So I found this course on Udemy that was 22 hours of just Angular 4, and it taught me some amazing ways to do some things. Some technologies I used was Angular 4, Node, Connect, Bcrypt to hash and salt the passwords, Ramda to pop up the notifications, TypeScript, which I absolutely love. By the way, Angular 4 is probably one of my favorite things ever right now. It's so fantastic, so fast, so comprehensive, it's amazing. Some future plans for making my website more awesome. One, I would like to export the research project into documents. If you fill out, a que if you fill out questions on my website, I don't want you to have to copy paste that into a document. You should just get a document that's ready for your actual interviews. Second, I want to do user testing. I would like people to go through my website, create projects, and tell me what they liked about it, what didn't make sense, what they think I should add. Three, I want to collaborate with social science students to create better guides. I don't think I'm at all qualified to make an entire guide off of every research method. So I would like to co collaborate with people who are much smarter than me to create these guides. Four, I want to offer much research project types. I absolutely love social science, and I love coding, and I love putting them together. And I would like to make my site as robust as possible and offer as many research projects as I can. Thank you guys so much. I really hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you want to contact me, this is my contact information. Feel free to reach me on any of these. Also, I'll be you know, around if you want to talk about coding, about sociology, about anything. And I really appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Thank you, guys.
as the last person, I would love to take this opportunity to just congratulate my classmates on a job super well done. I'm so proud of every single one of you. It's pretty amazing what we've been able to accomplish in six months, and I'm just really proud to have known all of you. All right. And on that note, who's ready to talk about politics? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Nathan Adlane. Um, I'm a full stack web developer here at Galvanize. And um, I used to, let's talk a little bit about myself, if this works. There we go. Um, I used to work in the nonprofit sector. I was a consultant for nonprofits, and we would use uh, a proprietary software that would help them raise money at their gala functions. We would actually automate their um, silent auctions so that they could bid on their, touch, on their uh, smartphones and on their iPads and stuff like that. So I could see firsthand the power that software could have in helping the, need, helping the needy and, and, and getting people where they need to be through software. So I was inspired to sort of pivot away from that position and <clears throat> try and make something on my own, try and do something that was you know, up to the task of being a public service to people. So I decided to get political. Um, I've been endlessly frustrated with the fact that people cannot be, um, you, know, you can't follow your representation, you can't follow your Congress people, you can't follow your representatives, and you can't hold them accountable for anything. With the, you know, today is, you know, all about misinformation, it's all about people putting fact as opinion out there, and it's really, really frustrating for me. So I wanted to make sure that I gave something back and was able to hold them accountable in some fashion. So, you know, I've written here, an informed electorate is a productive electorate. So let's kind of just get into what this is. I can stop meandering about with my words and just sort of tell you what this is all about. So what we have here with Smart Votes is basically um, a, a centralized location where you can find information about your representatives and your senators. So, you know, if we were to go in here, we can actually, you know, tool around to all the different states and make sure if we wanted to find a representative from a specific state, we can do so. Let's just check out California real quick. And through doing this, we're able to, you know, get a list of representatives on the left side here. And if we wanted to check out John Garamendi, we have a lot of salient information here regarding his campaign and his tenure in office. We have donations that he's received. We have the sectors that he's actually received them from. He's got a pretty big bump there in labor. We've got his voting history there. And we also have the committees that he is part of. So you can do this for every representative and every senator in the entire Congress, but where smart votes really shines, in my opinion, is that you can go back and you can actually create a voting record for yourself. What I've got here are 20 pieces of actual legislation that have come before representatives, and you can cycle through them. What we can also do is vote on them. So you're building yourself an, a voting record based on real legislation. So if we are to go back to our representatives, and we go back and we go see Mr. What was it, Garamendi? We go see Mr. Garamendi, we can actually hold him accountable. If I were in that district that he represented, we, we can hold him accountable based on what we've got here. So I might compare my votes button here. I actually have an empirical number there that's 21%. That represents the amount of times that I vote with Mr. Garamendi based on what I have set up here. So what we have is the ability to hold people accountable based on their voting records. And I think that's, you know, a game changer. I think that's something that everybody should know when they step into the voting booth. I think that's something that's absolutely critical for every person to know. Um, I'm getting real deep and real important here. Um, so let's go back to the slides. Um, when we talk about smart votes, we're talking about using an Angular JS framework for the front end a Postgres is Express backend. We use connects to get the queries done, and we actually have an OAuth, or excuse me, an Auth0 handling some Auth um, challenges that I had. Uh, this is obviously very dry content. There's <laughs> <laughs> legislative information here. We actually have PDFs that you can find where you can actually read through some actual legislation. That's not exciting. But, you know, trying to make that exciting and trying to have that digestible and have that engaging for you in some sort of way is what was probably the largest challenge here. And the sheer volume of information. Like, I, I have about five APIs that I'm touching where, you know, there's just nothing but information being flooded my way. So discerning what I thought was important, what I thought was critical for the user to understand was really probably the greatest challenge I had. But let's talk about the future of smart votes. Smart votes 
I think really hits the ground running when it's scaled upwards. You know, we have a personal relationship with our representative right now, and based on that, we can get that percentage. But imagine for, you know, the, this district in Colorado, imagine if you were to take 60% of the people here and plug them into smart votes and had their user input and their votes, we could actually get a decent idea of how we want this district to actually move forward and how we want them or what the wishes are of that district. So if we can look at what the voting record is for this representative and it's not in line with the wishes of the district, we, you know, that's the ball game in, in my opinion. We can actually maybe have some empirical evidence to get them out and actually put that in people's minds and, and, and have that as a jumping off point for really making some change. That is my spiel. Um, again, I'm Nathan Adlane. This is my contact information. So uh, if you'd like to get a hold of me, I'm happy to sit and chat with you about politics or really anything at all. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's all of them. That's <laughs> all 19 of them. <laughs> Congratulations, everybody. Hey, gang. Oh, were you expecting me to not be loud? Um, all right, so you can see my, my expertly prepared speech. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, can I get uh, one more round of applause for all the students who presented today? Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, they uh, listed off all the people who have been involved in this code work. It's, uh, it's more than 10 instructors. Uh, so, for them in general, and Danny Fritz in particular, another round of applause, please. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kyle Coberly. I'm the faculty director for this program. I've been a part of about a dozen of these capstone presentations so far, and they keep getting better and better and better every time. They push us as instructors to be more. Uh, this is 100% not a stale job. Uh, the people that you saw today used to be soldiers and musicians and financial advisors and economists and teachers and they still are that's kind of the neat thing about software development is they're still all of those things and you saw that represented in these projects and now they can do that that's really powerful it's like you inspire your instructors on a daily basis to become more ourselves by the things that you do. There's this, there's this attitude in the software community right now that programmer, coder, these are kind of pejorative words like, don't call me coder, bro! And I, and I identify with that sentiment a lot because there's an implication in that that uh, like a coder is somebody who just does what they're told and turns that into code. And that's what computers do. Computers do what they're told. Every single presentation you saw tonight had some non-trivial element in it that was not covered in the program. We don't teach VR, we don't teach IoT, we don't teach C++. We don't teach any of the things that you saw. These were things that came out of the passions and the talents for learning technology of the, of the students that you saw. And I think that modern problems need to be solved with people's entire self, entire souls, brains, all of it. And it's not about following instructions super well. We already have things that do that. We need people who can bring their entire selves to bear to, to make things better. Um, so uh, in, in closing, uh, I want to thank loved ones for the program. Uh, I know that a lot of you are here tonight. Uh, this is a massive sacrifice on your problem. I'm sure that there was, uh, you basically didn't get to see the people you care about for six months, and uh, that's our fault. Thank you. <laughs> but thank you so much for the opportunity. 
um, to employers, hiring uh, managers out there. Uh, you saw the same pres presentation that I did, so act fast. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I want to do a quick standout with the students, but uh, we're, we're going to be hanging out up there. You can chat with people, presentations you saw today, uh, get more drinks. But all in all, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. <laughs>